All right, so today we're in for a treat. We have Walid Kadus, who is the chief scientist at AnyScale. And again, full disclosure, I am an advisor to AnyScale. And for our listeners, this is an episode that you will really want to visit the episode notes because Walid has uh, authored a, not, a lot of uh, uh, great posts on the topics we're going to talk about today, which is mainly large language models. And he also gave a talk at the AI conference. So I will place many, many links in the episode notes. And as you'll find out, uh, there's a reason why Walid has become one of my go-to resources as far as uh, practical advice for uh, you know these empirical best practices for uh, using LLM. So Walid, long-winded introduction, but welcome to the Data Exchange Podcast. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks. It's good to talk to you again, Ben. All right. So topic number one, open source and proprietary LLM. So I just gave a talk uh, last week in DC. And uh, I I guess, you know, I'm, we're kind of in a bubble here where we think that people know a lot about these things. But I don't think many people are really that familiar that uh, some of these open source models have gotten good. But... <laughs> Let's start there, Walid. So what do people need to know about the open source models? I know when you give talks, you always preface it by saying, you know, this GPT-4 is an amazing model. Yeah. Don't underestimate <laughs> GPT-4. Yeah, so one of my heuristics is you should always prototype on GPT-4 because if it doesn't work with GPT-4, it's probably not going to work with anything else. Um, but that's a great place to start. I think really one of the key things to realize is that there are pros and cons of each, and it's really about uh, taking advantage of those pros and cons. So, um, and so I don't adopt a, like kind of an idealistic point of view that you should only also, like use open source models, nor do at the other end, I kind of say that, you know, you should only use proprietary models. Well, GPT-4 is the best thing out there right now. Um, there's no doubt that it has cost issues. Um, in one of the presentations I did, I did an analysis that say you wanted to build an email summarizer. You know, if you, if you tried to do that with using GPT-4, it would cost you something like um, $300 per person to onboard them and about $35,000 to consume their existing email. So it's just like, it's crazy expensive and the open source models can be considerably cheaper. Um, it's a good thing to ask about GPT-3.5 Turbo but our experience is that some of the open source models actually outperform uh, GPT 3.5 Turbo. In some of the tests we've seen, for example, Llama 270B, which is one of the most popular open source models um, um, uh, that Meta put out a, a while ago, is, um, is is more is more effective as well as being cheaper. So we found for some applications that Llama 270B outperformed. Um, 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 uh, GPT 3.5 Turbo, and at one twentieth the cost of what GPT 4 costs. And as you know, these these numbers can really add up. And so when we look at AnyScale endpoints, which is our commercial um, open AI compatible type experience, but just it uses open source models instead of open AI's models, we see a lot of customers who are extremely price sensitive using us, and especially the smaller models, the like the Llama 7B model and more recently, the Zephyr model, which has just come out um, and is a fine-tuned version of the Mistral model. So, you know, it takes a while to stay on top of all of these open source models, but we've seen quite a few people that are using Zephyr models that only cost 15, 000, 15 cents per million tokens. That's a very, very low price. But it's not just about price. Um, I think another... So, so wait, uh, so, uh, Walid, so... Heuristic number one, if you can't get it to work on Claude or GPT-4, it may not work on open source. So work on open source, but yeah. basically uh, one of your other heuristics is with the open source models, don't uh, don't pack the context window or don't over complicate your prompt, right? Uh, yeah. So one of the other heuristics that I found the hard way is uh, especially open source models. GPT-4 is a bit better in this regards. It's usually a good idea to um, separate out what you want an LLM to do. So for example, let's say we were working on a system, AnyScale Doctor, and AnyScale Doctor had a summarization stage and then a classification, you know, we had a summarize and classify as a single stage. 
And then we said, wait a second, let's break it up into two phases. Let's do a summarize phase and a classify phase. And the combined uh, summarize classify was about 65% accurate. And then each of the summarize and classify phases, when we did them separately, was like 90% accurate. So the total product was 81% accurate. So sometimes we find that, you know, even though um, open source models are cheaper, you do, do need to do a little bit of extra work and kind of adjustment to take into account the limitations of open source models. But the difference in price can be so serious that um, it's worth the overhead. Um, so generally, Walid, uh, we're in a very empirical stage, right? So there's no substitute for trying things on your own data, on your own prompts. Yep. But just generally speaking, you, you've you noticed certain things about these open source models. Like, for example, I think you've uh, you've said publicly that when it comes to summarization, they're actually pretty good. Yep. So are there a few other tasks where you, you think that the open source models are, are quite good? Yeah, so I, I think one way to summarize it would be to say something like the open source models are good at summarization. They're good for uh, retrieval augmented generation approaches, which we'll discuss later. Where they are weak at the moment is on the analytical and kind of reasoning abilities. You know, that's really kind of their, their area where they, they could grow in development. And they're also missing a few key features. And those two key features are function calling, which is the ability to ensure that the output of an LLM adheres to a particular format or schema. And then the other one is large context windows. In other words, you know, most of the open source models are limited to say 4,000 um, tokens as input. So um, assuming that you you can overcome those issues, um, open source models um, can definitely uh, handle retrieval augmented generation, can definitely handle summarization, um, can handle many generative tasks, um, but they they are just missing a few features that the open source, uh, that the closed source models have. Of course, so, there's a lot so, of activity to add those missing features to open source, and we're already seeing um, open source models with much larger, larger context windows, and also what's called constrained generation, which is our first step towards function calling. So the uh, as far as the analytical and reasoning, so yeah. this, in your mind, this is not something that can be solved by kind of investing time, refining and simplifying your prompt. Well, to be honest about it, um, let me be blunt. Um, I'm not sure that any of the current generation of applications that are most practical that we'll see in industry in the next, say, six to 12 months really need advanced reasoning. Maybe that's a controversial position, but you see, reasoning has kind of a dark side, right? Like one of the things that we're always worried about is these LLMs either hallucinating or having um, like weird outputs. The the more constrained you can be with the LLM, the lower risk it is. So if your if you, if your system doesn't have to reason, if it's very simple, and is doing retrieval augmented generation or talking to your data. Um, in some sense, the reasoning abilities, if you try to use them, can be a liability. The set of things that this thing could come up with is, is crazy, right? So, um, you know, for example, if your system can write Python code and execute Python code, suddenly your surface area of possible outcomes has kind of exploded, right? So, um, you know, it's, it's really a case of let's, at least in this first generation, try to keep things simple and keep things um, accessible. And, uh, you know, most of the applications I, I see are like very for, uh, straightforward step style, what you might call a directed acyclic graph of steps. I know that the more advanced systems out there kind of do things like go in a loop and iterate or come up with a plan and then execute on each stage of the plan. But that's not what I'm seeing people use LLMs for in practice. You know, the, the things I'm using, seeing people uh, use LLMs for in practice are summarization. Uh, retrieval augmented generation, um, talking to your data and talking to your living system. So kind of imagine that you have like a network or or it's kind of like dashboard plus plus. And, and, finally, and of course, uh, code generation. And by the way, uh, quick question. So what's your high level assessment of code llama versus uh, the uh, proprietary uh, Code llama is really like surprisingly good. And we've started to switch to it for, for some of our applications. I don't think, you know, um, I think probably something like GitHub Copilot is probably slightly better in some ways. 
But Code Llama is actually good in other ways too. It has a bigger context window. And so ironically, we've seen some applications. It's not just for code. It's for talking about programming. And in that case, it's actually pretty good. Um, there's actually two variants, the Python variant and the Instruct variant. We find ourselves using the Instruct variant a lot more. But just to kind of finish what I was saying earlier, the third type of application, aside from the kind of the RAG family and the summarization family, is really the um, in-context family. So that's things like GitHub Copilot. Or you have an application and the logic is built straight into the application. So another example of that is any scale doctor. So imagine like a super intelligent Jupyter notebook that every time you get an error, you press a button and it diagnoses the error and recommends fixes. You know, those types of in-context applications are probably the trickiest to build, but are also the highest impact. So the statistics on things like GitHub Copilot are, are very strong in terms of very large boosts to developer productivity. So, you know, I'm really excited about the in-context applications, but really that's a more advanced level than the summarization and the retrieval family of, of practical applications. So so your your assessment is Code Llama versus GitHub Copilot. Uh because I'm a user of GitHub Copilot. Should I just yeah. abandon GitHub Copilot? No, I, I, like again, I don't <laughs> think the, the the models are quite there. You know, uh, Code Llama is quite as good as GitHub Copilot. Um, but you know, you can definitely use it and it's really great in a conversational context as well. So um, you can just use it as a system to ask or generate code and do those types of things. More the way that people, you know, our preferred way of using um, um, Code Llama is, is almost like a conversation partner. How do I do X? And it comes back with suggestions about how to do X. That's slightly different to how you typically use GitHub Copilot, which is, you know, autocomplete on steroids is maybe the best way to think about it. By the way, so in my talk, I, I kind of uh, talked up the notion of these open source models, and then I had a slide where I go, but there's a catch. And then in this slide, I I kind of collected what you guys have written, what Databricks has written in terms of deployment. So mm -hmm. all the things you need to get right in order to yeah. deploy this model. So yeah. it's actually uh, uh, not in the wheelhouse of most themes because... Uh, they're still these are still large models, even though we call them smaller models. And uh, there's a lot of IP and engineering that goes into deploying these models. So at this point, really, I mean, any scale endpoint is kind of a no-brainer. I mean, uh, it's, it's cheap. You swipe a credit card, you're good to go. And then um, if you want, you have private endpoints as well, right? Mm -hmm. So so th talk to us about uh, should someone try to deploy this on their own or Forget it. Um, it really depends on your level of technical expertise. So let's yeah. let's talk about a few different options. Uh, and really, it's about um, you know the right tool for the right job. If you are absolutely, it has to run on prem. You know, it's not allowed to put a single byte into the cloud. Then really, at the moment, self hosting is kind of what you have to do. Um, there are not many providers that provide on prem LLM execution at the moment. Um, and part of that is because the hardware to run these machines is is kind of complicated. You know, you're talking about um, NVIDIA DGX1 boxes that have eight GPUs in it and cost, you know, several hundred thousand dollars, which not everybody has in their on-prem facilities. But, you know, if that's what you want to do, that's what you have to do. And the options there are like we have systems like um, Ray LLM, which Ray LLM builds on top of Ray, a very popular distributed computing platform. Uh, to serve LLMs effectively. Um, there's also options like TRT LLM, Tensor RT LLM, which comes from NVIDIA. Uh, and both of those have performance advantages and disadvantages. But, you know, there's there's kind of these middle grounds. So let's talk about the the, the obvious one is kind of like the shared, shared set of machines amongst many users. So, you know, you might have, th this is kind of like, imagine that you're doing um, provisioning and there's kind of like a shared host and a dedicated host. So the shared option is, you know, a number of companies share the same GPU and that's what AnyScale Endpoints is. And that because you're aggregating across multiple customers, you can save a lot of money because you basically pay per token and that's what makes it very cost effective. Um, at the other end of the extreme is kind but, of- But like, uh, Walid, you guys, you guys also have uh, invested a lot in terms of really maximizing utilization. So 
yeah there's a lot of things that maybe a regular team may not have we we right. optimize the st stack from bottom to top right so everything from um CUDA kernels to wait how quickly can we bring up um, a new instance to can we use spot instances and on demand instances to you know using different clusters of machines like lambda labs but being able to switch to aws when you need to so there's like at every layer of the stack there's optimizations and that's what we need to do to get that price really low and uh it, it's it's a pretty competitive environment i gotta tell you uh but still any scale is on top at least for now um, and you and you you guys just released a post of on you know how to uh i guess uh really kind of uh assess uh inference performance in a reproducible way and you have all sorts of metrics for doing yeah. that right so, so, so cl clearly this is a topic you guys have thought about and trying to squeeze the most efficiency and optimization out of oh uh, yeah yeah no um you know it really does matter to optimize and also optimizing things like auto scaling up and down so uh, we released uh, an open source benchmark system called LLM Perf that actually is starting to be used in the community. So we've seen some other competitors of ours also standardize on LLM Perf. And we really discuss in depth what are the measures that matter. And you know really it comes down to four measures. The first one is time to first token. So if you're in a streaming application, how fast before the user sees like the first piece of information come back. And the other one is um uh, the others are end-to-end -end latency. So depending on your application, how long it takes for all of the input to arrive. Inter-token latency, so how much between each token. And finally, one that's really only useful when you're thinking about the system as a whole. So if you're using a shared instance, you don't need to worry about this. But if you're managing your own system, the other thing you have to worry about is throughput. So for example, a typical system, you know, uh, it can take one input at a time and generate um, maybe something like 50 tokens per second. But that's not all the machine can do. And if you have 10 people using the machine, it can generate 50 tokens per second for each of those users for 500 tokens per second. So that's what we mean by throughput. Usually for the A100s, we can go up to 200 concurrent requests. And again, you know, that's what gives us that power. Not many users will have 200 concurrent requests, but aggregated across the globe, there are probably 200 concurrent requests, right? So what we care about is the 50 tokens per second that each user experiences but the fact that we can have 200 of them for a total of um, whatever it is, uh, a thousand, um, 10,000 tokens per second, right? So throughput is the one that matters if you're managing your own machines. And so we've uh, standardized ways to do that, that really um, test the machines, make sure that you can't take cut corners by having variants, by us doing things like varying the size of the input, varying the size of the output, so that the, you, know, you can't um, really... Um, hack it easily. So I put a lot of effort into that and it's really paying off in terms of a standardized way of measuring performance. Performance, of course, is very sensitive to your application. So we have the right knobs in LLM Perf that say my my typical input is this big, my typical output is this big. Okay, and there's this much standard deviation in them. For those circumstances, I can run it against three or four different providers and choose the one that's best for me, right? So the idea is that you can take LLM Perf change the input and output uh, token counts to what you need them to be, and then get the best system that performs for your application. But you know, beyond the, the shared instances, the next step up is dedicated instances. And that's where there's a machine that just belongs to you, runs in your cloud, uses your machines and uses uh, privileges granted that, to that machine so that it's not accessible to the public. And that's not much harder to manage than the AnyScale endpoints. It's just the question is, how do you maximize utilization? So for example, if you're running one of the larger models like Llama 270B, you need four GPUs to run that. It turns out that that's about $75,000 a year. So that's whether you generate one token an hour or a million tokens an hour, it's gonna cost you the same amount, right? That's the big concern. And so you kind of have these three options. The first one is the self-hosted option. Then there's the dedicated instance option, and then there's the you know kind of the um, public shared um, instance, kind of what OpenAI does, right? You don't get your own machine with OpenAI; you're just using one machine that's part of a fleet of machines, and you can choose where on the on the spectrum of trade-offs of cost versus privacy and control that you want, and that's especially one of the advantages of open source models. 
which is something that you know kind of exists in the in the proprietary models, but not to the same extent, not with the same flexibility. By the way, I think I, I, I've, I've mentioned uh, this to you uh, in the past, in that, in that uh, I've now shifted most of my API calls to the AnyScale endpoints from OpenAI. And uh, to our listeners, you should try it. I mean, it's fast and more and stable. So yeah. stable is a, a big thing. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we measure exception rates. Um, and our exception rate is considerably lower than OpenAI's exception rates, which frankly was a surprise to us. Um, and then the other thing is we have higher rate limits, um, whereas the rate limits for some other providers can be rather low. So we allow up to 30 concurrent connections, concurrent requests, or about 100 requests per minute, roughly speaking. So right. we see very low exception rates and very consistent latencies. And we really, like we have all the monitoring in place, um, you know, all of that kind of stuff to make sure that our customers have a good experience. All right. Topic number two is fine tuning, um, which uh, is also uh, one of these topics that uh, we all hear about, but uh, there's also a lot of details that go in, get, go into it. But uh, uh, before we go into the details, I have to uh, tell our listeners, I've actually s started fine tuning a lot of models because of, any scales uh, fine tuning uh, service and yeah. uh, what it, what the service boils down to is really I'm really essentially just focusing on the fine tuning data set <laughs> and yeah. then once once I have the fine tuning data set I kick off the service and then I get an email telling me here's the endpoint for your fine tuned model yeah and uh, and so you might ask oh, why do I need a fine tuned model well one uh, uh, most likely you're going to fine tune a smaller model. So that model is going to be now much faster mm -hmm. and it's going to be cheaper mm -hmm. and probably just as accurate as the uh, proprietary models and pro maybe even more. Right. Yeah. So, so, so uh, but then uh, uh, every time I do fine tuning, I have Walid's post on fine tuning in the back of my mind, which is fine tuning is for form, not facts. And I feel guilty, but then the stuff works. So what do you I'm, I'm just yeah. plowing ahead. Yeah. So, so maybe, maybe we can discuss it. Right. Yeah. I think uh, many people see fine tuning as kind of like a panacea, a perfect solution to all your LLM problems. Yeah. And it's, and it's not, it's really important to understand as understand what like was fine very narrow task it, it works and what right. it's not good for. Yeah. So so um, maybe maybe I can give an example, right? Um, if if you want to make your LLM sound like a pirate or Shakespearean, right? Fine tuning is the perfect tool. It's about the choice of the words that you use. It's about you know the the particular constructs. The information itself doesn't change, right? It's not like you're presenting different information than you would otherwise. Um, but another example is, say, natural language to SQL conversion. The SQL is a very, very standardized format. And so for something like natural language to SQL conversion, um, fine tuning can really help. In fact, we've fine tuned a 7 billion parameter model, again, 15 cents per, per, per million tokens. Um, without fine tuning, it had about 3% accuracy, so completely useless. GPT-4 had about 80% accuracy, but that's without a fine tune. But by fine tuning, we were able to boost the 3% model up to 86%, exceeding even the performance of GPT-4 at about one two hundredth the cost. So fine tuning can definitely help. And um, again, you know, the more standardized the, the input and the output is, you know, um, it, you know, if it's, uh, you know, what do people prefer, you know, uh, what style of language, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, maybe at a limit, you know, even some kind of simple translation tasks, um, fine tuning really helps. Um, the problem is people assume that it fixes facts. And really fine tuning doesn't help for facts because the information in the LLM is so deeply encoded. I mean, it's an emergent property. We don't even understand how it stores it. That fine tuning can't really affect knowledge in the same way. So we did this example where we took Shakespeare um, and uh, we fine-tuned the model on Shakespeare, and it sounded Shakespearean, but then we tried to change a fact. We tried to change the name of Romeo to Bob and asked the, the updated LLM, who was, who was, you know, who was in love with Juliet? And it net, you know, we, we ramped up the temperature, which should increase how varied the, the messages are, 
to 0.9, which is pretty high. And it's, it never once said Bob. It was just Romeo and Juliet was so entrenched into the model that it was impossible to pull it out and convince it that Romeo was called Bob instead. But if you had a RAG system, a retrieval augmented generation system, which we'll talk about, or you had um, information in the context, like saying, actually, what happened is we renamed Bob to uh, Romeo to Bob, or you had actually a passage of text where everywhere it used to say Romeo now says Bob, then the LLM has a shot, right? Um, so it's really important. I know it's kind of like uh, confusing a little bit, but the rule of thumb that we have is, you know, fine tuning is for form, not for facts. RAG is for facts. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, and uh, as far as far as the uh, fine, by the way, uh, for our listeners, uh, uh, fine tuning in the any scale service, like I said, uh, you end up focusing on your fine tuning data set. But in the back of your mind, you can think of it as like kind of similar to the workflow we're familiar with for supervised machine learning. First, you create a labeled data set. Mm -hmm. Then you choose the fine tuning of uh, the uh, algorithm, and then you, then you uh, train the model, and then you're ready. So some yeah. something like this, but the service actually allows you to focus on your, on your uh, fine tuning data set. And I don't have a rule of thumb, but I I've been successful with a couple of thousand examples, sometimes even six hundred examples. Yeah. Um, really, your experiences uh, do vary depending on the data and the problem. But, you know, there are ways if the data set is small, then we can get more value out of them. It's like, so there's a there's a question of how many times do we scan through the data over and over again? And if you have a small set like 600, then any scale will automatically go, oh, for 600, probably you should run this for four epochs, which really kind of inculcates more of the fine tuning there. But if you have 10,000, you run 10,000 for one epoch. So there's some um, adjustments of the algorithm that we make depending on the size of the data set. But like you said, it's really, you know, once you have your data set, which is not an easy problem to be clear, but if you have a data set that this was the user input and this was the ideal user output, that's basically what we accept as kind of training data. So this was the input, this was the perfect output. You just give us thousands of examples of that and it's literally upload a file with just some JSON in it. And then 20 minutes later, you have a fine-tuned model that's better at outputting things more similar to what was uh, when the out, when um, to what matches the input. So it's it's not actually a very hard process. The, the thing you have to really put put thought into is how am I going to collect high-quality data that I can use to fine-tune my model. And um, and here I I refer to a, a suggestion you you gave me in mm -hmm. a conference. Uh, a month or so ago, you said, you know, Ben, you may have to spend data to save data. Yeah. So, so uh, one, one way to do it, listeners, is uh, if you think GPT four is good at this, good at this task, then you can you can go to OpenAI, generate your uh, fine tuning data set, and and then you might ask yourself, well, why not just go use OpenAI and GPT four all the way? Well, because to save money. To have a smaller model that's faster for this yeah. one very specific task, right? Okay. Yeah. So we extensively use GPT-4 for evaluation. So if I have a new model, is the old model better than the new model? We can you can give both answers to GPT-4, and it's very good at evaluating which answer is is better. Um, we should talk if we can. We can talk about some tricks you have to do to make sure that the biases don't get in the way. But generally, we use GPT-4 because of its power. And we also, like you said, use um, use it as a generative tool. So often the way you solve problems with LLMs is using other LLMs, right? Um, and GPT-4 is very good for generative problems in, in general, and also very good for, um, for evaluation. And so, for example, if you're trying to build a question answering system, you can flip the problem on its head and, and ask GPT-4, here's a passage give me six different questions you can ask about this package, uh, past passage, right? So there are all these tricks that you can do to use GPT-4 to generate data that you can then use to fine tune your model. And so the by the way, uh, uh, to SQL. Yeah. Walid, I never hear uh, the word uh, Claude out of your mouth. Is there, re is there a reason why? Because I find Claude is also quite good. Yeah, um, I've just started to work with Claude. Originally, I started working with Claude 
um, because of its 100,000 character, uh, 100,000 token limit. By the way, when I say it's good, it, the answers are good. I'm not vouching for the latency or the yeah. stability, but but the answers yeah. can be good. Yeah. yeah, the answers can definitely be good and in many cases on par. And until recently, OpenAI didn't, couldn't match the context window of 100,000 tokens. So what I was doing was I was experimenting with like putting gigantic documents and then asking Claude to answer questions, which even GPT-4 couldn't do. Uh, the most recent release of GPT-4 has expanded it to 128,000. So now it's an even playing field and it's, you know, you can get this now on both. Um, but it's still in preview. So last time I tried to use the new version of GPT-4, I'm, I'm pleasantly hacking away and then after doing some experiments that involved a few hundred examples, it's like, no, your limit is 200 um, uh, requests per day. You've exhausted that. So sorry, you can't run any more experiments today. And obviously 200 requests per day is not like a practical amount. So it's in preview. And that means that we can't kind of fully use it the way that we can use Claude right now. And it's, it's actually been really good in terms of being able to answer some of those real-time question answering um, type problem. Someone gives you a document and just says, here's the document. I have five questions about this document. Get the answers for me as quickly as you can. Um, Claude 2 is really good for that. Um, there are some tricky parts. And one of the odd things with these LLMs is that they remember the things at the beginning and the things at the end. And they don't always pay enough attention to the things in the middle. So, you know, sometimes uh, you have to do little hacks to kind of get that performance. And this is still a new area of research, um, but um, it tends to not be able to retrieve data in the middle. It's called the lost in the middle problem. Um, and there are ways to mitigate that. So we're still experimenting with like really, really large context windows and what works in that context versus taking a document and cutting it into pieces and then trying to answer questions uh, across the little pieces and synthesize an answer from that. So we talked about open source models, uh, fine tuning, Yep. Now, uh, augmented language model, so retrieval augmented generation, which uh, I don't like. The, it's so long. I asked the people at Vectera, we need a new term. They said, we're starting to use grounded generation, but then no one uses it. So we're always end up using retrieval augmented generation. Anyway, so yeah. I had Philip and Goku here. So we went through some of their findings in terms of their experiments. Mm -hmm. around rag yeah. and uh actually uh i really liked your uh two by two uh tax uh diagram for mm -hmm. uh, uh a simple taxonomy for rag where one axis you have the freshness of the data is it static or real time mm -hmm. then the other axis is it unstructured data or do you have uh somewhat structured data involved yeah. um so uh, beyond beyond uh, what Philip and Goku have uh, have told me and have they they put out in their post. So by the way, uh, just to re recap for our listeners, so some of the things they found is chunking seems to be quite impactful. Mm -hmm. So make sure you play with chunking. Uh, embedding models may be less impactful, but chunking, but than chunking, but also worth playing with and don't default to the top rated, the top ranked embedding model in the leaderboard uh, and so on and so forth. I think metadata is also seems uh, impactful, right? So so anything else you want to say about RAG that people should uh, pay attention to in terms of their own RAG experiments? Yeah, so I, I think I have a few thoughts. One, one is one of the results. I think the two most interesting results is they found that 600 is about the right size for chunking and they, they kind of experimented on it. I think the other thing that I found interesting was this idea of like, they kept including the size of the, the N results that they return and they saw progressive improvements until they ran out of context window. So I think one thing that I'm experimenting with, uh, and it's still not kind of a standard technique yet, but is to get more examples. So say you could get like 15 examples and then run the LLM on each example, or sorry, each, each uh, retrieved result and say, is this part relevant for answering this question. So you have like an LLM pre-filtering stage before it gets to the final generation stage. And that's something that I've been experimenting on that's initially showing good results, but I you know, haven't finished those experiments yet. But the idea here is that 
you know, rag is not a solved, solved problem. And what we're seeing now is a new generation of, you know, RAG has this very complex pipeline where you take the data, you embed it, you have to find the right embedding. Uh, inform information extraction, right? So which PDF yeah. data extraction tools should I use, right? So yeah. and, and so I like, you know, um, Pinecone. Um, I think the three leaders in kind of like just stop worrying about kind of all of that stuff are Pinecone, Vectara, and um, Elasticsearch, right? So all three of those have seen this as essentially a search problem. Mm -hmm. which is the right way to look at it. And that allows for things like hybrid search that's not purely based on semantic information. You can filter the information. You can have neural re-ranking. You know, there's Re-ranking, yeah, yeah. BM25 and the re-ranking, right? So, yeah, so you yeah. can... You, I mean, I'm really starting to see a, re a lot of development in this kind of... Don't just see it as about the vector database. It's about so much more than the oh, vector yeah. database. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. Um, and so you have people like uh, Vectara who are optimizing models for retrieval, not for embedding, right? Um, I've often had to do things like, if you have a long search question, you have to kind of, like if you have an input, you know, what is the, you know, the capital of France or whatever, you kind of have to extract the query from the actual thing that the user put in. So there's all of these subtleties about RAG, but they're being solved to the extent now that even OpenAI has a new API for supporting uh, RAG, and their new GCP's product has a nice interface where you can just upload a document and it indexes it and can use it for RAG and handle all of those complex problems for you. So we're seeing a lot of improvement on kind of RAG going from something that's a bit complicated to use to to it becoming easier to use. Um, but it you know it still requires some fine tuning and it's still early days. And you know there's all of these knobs that sometimes have to be adjusted depending on your use case. And and RAG is one of these things, Walid, where actually if you have a bunch of PDF files and you do basically RAG out of the box without any tweaking, you feel like, oh, I'm getting some value because, yeah, the, it's uh, producing answers that seem to come from the PDF files. It's only when you actually know the PDF files well that you realize, hey, it's actually miss missing a lot of things that... that that's yeah. in there, right? So, um, and, you know, it's it's it really does show the problem of scale. So if you have like 20 PDF or five PDF files, RAG will magically like work really well. As the size of the data grows, the chances of, you know, precision or recall going down, like the RAG returning irrelevant information or the RAG missing critical information, you know, those are the two failure modes, either missing the critical stuff or including irrelevant stuff goes up. And so by the time you get to hundreds of megabytes of data, it starts to, what looked really doable with like 10 documents, suddenly when you have 2000 documents, it just doesn't work anymore. And that's really kind of uh, one of the trends within RAG is kind of expanding. The, you don't just look at the text itself, but what's the area around the text? What's the abstract of this particular document? Um, what's the context in which I understand this? You know, maybe you do two passes and find what are the five documents that are most relevant for answering this question at, at level one. And then, okay, now I'll look in depth in these five documents to do this, you know, to find the answer that I'm looking for. So one thing to realize with RAG is performance at small scale is not the same as performance at like large scales. And I don't, I mean, of course the, um, the latency performance and so on is one question, but I actually mean the quality of performance as you get. As there are more ways to screw up and retrieve the right, right wrong information, you know, the accuracy goes down. So so one of the components of RAG, obviously, is the LLM, because, with you know, I mean, without LLM, we're just search, right? Yeah. So uh, tying this back to the uh, earlier part of the conversation, Walid, so uh, let's say... I tune the hell out of everything in my rag. Does that mean I can get by with Llama 7, 7 billion? Um, yes. Uh, I mean, it's pro again, it depends. I mean, uh, I, I, I have this massive, not massive, but you know, super convoluted question, you know, okay. like, yeah, yeah. I so mean, uh, will, will Llama 7 billion be enough? Um, it would. And I would suggest people have a look at Zephyr, Zephyr 7B. Because on some of the evaluation metrics, it's actually outperforming Llama 2 70B now. Okay. So um, I would probably look at Zephyr 7B and see if it's good enough. 
it depends a little bit on how much synthesis or logical, like, you know, if it's a question like a customer support application where essentially what the LLM is doing is summarizing the facts, probably a small LLM will be pretty good. But if it's a complex reasoning application like question answering on open data sets, you know, you you put in a complex story and like, or or it's character. like a five part five part question. Yeah, or there's kind of like you know the you have to combine information from document A and document B to answer the question. Then you might not find find that you know Lamas you know or a seven billion parameter model is is enough. So really, what it keeps coming back to is like, do you need that analytical and reasoning capability? As you need that, you need to go kind of up the size of stack you know, culminating at GPT-4 with 1.4 trillion parameters or whatever, right? Um, and the more advanced the reasoning and the analysis and the combination and the synthesis you need to do, the richer the model you need. But you'd be surprised how often you can get away with a 7 billion parameter model. So I think uh, to some extent, uh, uh, fine tuning for people familiar with supervised machine learning maps more naturally to their way of thinking, because as I described it, right? So I have a labeled data set in supervised machine learning. Same thing with fine tuning, except as Waleed described, the labeled data set will be here's the prompt, here's the desired output, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then and then I follow kind of the workflow of supervised machine learning. In RAG, it's a le little less familiar, but if you if you follow if you uh, listen carefully to what we've been talking about, lot uh, RAG has knobs that you have to tune. Mm -hmm. So, but what does that mean, tuning knobs in a rag? That means I must have like a a uh, kind of a uh, gold standard data set and then some metrics for measuring whether rag is uh, working or not. So, Walid, can you talk the audience very briefly into uh, uh, how do they actually conduct and measure this rag? Uh, yeah. What so is think, the, what is the data set that they need to prepare? Right? Yeah, so I, I remember for Philip and Goku's work, they actually went through and manually labeled. So we were working, you know, that problem yeah. was basically answering questions about Ray and AnyScale, right? And they they took a set, you know, we have like a Slack where people can ask questions. So we took the questions from Slack and generated the perfect output, right? And then we used GPT-4 to kind of assess each of the measures. If this is the reference answer, does this text contain the reference answer? And so what that gives you is like, once you had like those 450, if I remember correctly, examples or so, that really gives you a way of evaluating. And many times you can evaluate each stage separately, kind of like an ablation test. You know, if I had, you, you build the whole system and then you tweak the embedding part and see if it changes the numbers. You tweak the chunking part and you see if it changes the numbers. So it really is about generating that kind of quick data, you know, that data set, you know, 400 is a pretty decent number. It took them like days to put that together, but it's the thing that really allowed them to iterate and make the system progressively better. And, and so that's why in this particular case, to investing in an evaluation data set and then using GPT-4 to decide, you know, is this close enough to what was in the kind of golden answer um, was really the, the key to it. Um, and again, you know, it really depends on your application. There are some very standardized data sets now for kind of checking that RAG works, but just because it works for like a trivia system or a narrative question doesn't mean RAG is going to work for your application, right? Really, you need to think about, uh, you really need to test and iterate on your particular application a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, the thing about these RAG experiments is that they can be very computationally uh, expand intensive, right? So, for example, embedding a million PDF files and you're playing around with the chunking and embedding, that's why you need something like Ray. Yes. Right? It Basically. really does. So, yeah. you know, th the, the, the thing, the, the way, where we end up using Ray is it's a generally very useful Swiss army knife for both the construction of LLMs and then serving the LLMs. Um, but to give you one example, uh, one of our blog posts, you know, we were building one of the indices and, you know, it's just taking a while. So one of our people said, what, what if I use Ray to speed this up? And he was able to use 20 GPUs at the same time because 
indexing is a is a very parallel or converting embedding is a very parallel operation. Mm -hmm. So in the space of a few lines, he was able to write some simple code. And we ingested something like 30, 30,000 pages of archive documents in the space of uh, four minutes. And so for that type of thing, Ray is just beautiful. It really does. And then the other thing Ray is useful for is like serving models and managing the complexities of, well, I, this, this one needs four GPUs. Do I have enough room on this machine? So at inference time, and you know, a lot of that we've built into Ray LLM, there's that additional flexibility, auto scaling capabilities that that Ray has. So, you know, often when we're doing these tests, you'll want to load an LLM, but then hit it with all of these requests at once. And, you know, being able to auto scale to take that load and to go, oh, oh, oh crap, I need like eight replicas to process this data. Um, you know, Ray handles that for you really, really well. And then it, once you've done the eight replicas, it goes, oh, I'm not needed anymore. And it auto scales back down to one. So I'll put you on the spot. The founders of AnyScale may not like me asking you this question, but uh, here's my kind of fantasy uh, service, Walid. Uh, it, I call it the new AutoML, which is basically yeah. let me focus on creating my fine-tuning data set or my, you know, my uh, gold standard data set of prompts and responses. Or same thing with same thing with the RAG, right? And then this, I uploaded the, 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 the service and the service will either create this uh, directed acyclic graph of custom fine-tuned models with routing model, routing it to the right fine-tuned model, or it will create in a principled way an optimized RAG setup for mm -hmm. me. Uh, and I think actually any scale is, uh, is quite uh, well positioned to do this just because both of these scenarios are computationally intensive and you need a distributed computing framework like Ray. So yeah. uh, talk me out of this uh, new auto ML fantasy. Oh, it is actually a very good idea. I, I think the devil's in the details though. And you know, I think one of these issues is you're assuming that it's easy to get the data and that's often the hardest. No, part. no, but uh, I, that's on me. I'm the I, I'm I'm responsible I, as, I the, as the user, as the user, right? So I know, I know the domain, uh, right? So uh, let's say I'm in the medical domain. I know the I I know what I want, right? So, yeah. but uh, by the way, so the second part of it, really, the the one where it gives me a principled ex rag setup. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's basically what Vectara might be able to do for yeah. you. In short um, order, they, right? They can they can do that. I don't know how much um real, but they may not have the uh, specific fine tuning and modification that they do. Yeah, yeah. By the way, uh, for our listeners, one thing that we haven't actually uh, uh, discussed uh, in somewhat detail is this AnyScale Doctor, which is this uh, service inside AnyScale platform. Yeah. Uh, for people that uh, uh, want to check it out, they can go to the AnyScale platform, but. N scale doctor, as I understand it, combines elements of RAG and this kind of multiple custom LLMs with a routing yeah. model, correct? Yeah, so, it's very much a directed acyclic graph. Um, but there's a there's RAG in there somewhere, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's actually yeah. the RAG system that Goku and Philip built. Yeah. So um, it's the so same. Then, so then this new auto ML could be yeah. like combines RAG and and uh, fine tuned models with a routing model. So Outside the outside the purview of Vectara. Yes. <laughs> I've just learned the hard way that the devil's in the details. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know. The work is always harder than, you know, it's always harder than it looks. But this is, I'm, yeah, I'm talking fantastic. about the science fiction and fantasy here, Walid. So. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the other interesting things in that AnyScale Doctor was really, uh, we're, we're seeing a lot of interest in what you might call mixture of experts. You know, some LLMs are better at some things than others. And so what happens if you have a smart router yeah. That actually knows, oh, if, it, if it's asking for code, I should probably send that to Code Llama. If it's asking for health advice, okay, probably that one should go to GPT-4. So we're starting Or to if it's asking for it's asking for SQL, you got the fine-tuned SQL fine -tuned model. Models, okay. Right, exactly. Yeah. So one area that we're exploring is very much this idea of a smart router. And that's where you have um, a router that actually itself can be an LLM, or it could be another model that says... For this given input, what is the LLM that performs the best on that? And you know, we don't know for sure, but there are some leaks that indicate that actually GPT-4 
is one of these mixtures of, of experts, right? It doesn't apply the whole 1.4 trillion parameters to every use case. It's more like there's specialized, specialized sub LLMs that it combines. And that's really starting to show promise in one of the cases. And it, you know, it's really impressive because it's, it gives you most of the quality benefit um, while not costing you much more. So I mentioned the email summarization use case um, or, or even Goku and Philips work. They showed that um, um, you could have a smart router that sent the most tricky queries to GPT-4 and the more easy queries to Llama 2. And it would send it to Llama 2 70B like 95% of the time and to GPT-4 5% of the time. The great thing is more or less that also reduced the cost by a factor of 10 too without decreasing quality. And so what can we do with intelligent general purpose smart routers is something that's like a very um, interesting topic of research for us. In that particular case, it was really funny. Uh, Philip and Goku just kind of built like a very simple bag of words, logistic regression that basically came down to, if it's about code, talk to GPT-4. If it's not about co code, talk to Llama 2. <laughs> and so um, we are really interested in this kind of mixture of experts. And you can imagine variants of that, like maybe even asking three different LLMs and then having another LLM that synthesizes the output from the three LLMs. What, uh, how much, uh, how much labeled data do you need to build this classifier slash routing model? Hmm, that's a good question. I don't know yet, but yeah. I don't think it's very much. Um, and sometimes something very simple works very well. Like I said, I just gave an example of like, yeah. forget the LLM. It's just an old fashioned logistic regression right. on like the words. I'm, I'm like literally a bag of mixed words, right? So um, I, I think, you know, one obvious area is fine tuning that smart router. And then the other really exciting possibility is the science fiction one is kind of, um, if you have the mixer or the synthesizer at the end, is you actually treat it like a gigantic single, like single transformer architecture and you can back propagate and forget fine tuning. It's like building a mega LLM out of little LLMs and then gluing them together to make like a super LLM. And that's kind of a really exciting possibility. Each one trained and fine tuned on different subsets. So it's really, I mean, in, in a funny way, it's going back to like the origins and roots of AI where they talked about society of mind, right? Like that one way to think about your brain is not as a single entity, but as kind of a little society where there are different people expressing different opinions. And somehow it's coming together and this, this idea of self is kind of really a cover for what is a society within the within the, the the confines of your own brain. And so, you know, I think Minsky used to write about this idea of, if I remember correctly, this idea of society of mind. And it's kind of weird the way things have come full circle in AI. And uh, to our listeners, actually embedded in uh, what uh, Walid has been discussing. Obviously, uh, as you do this mixture of experts, your your well, your main goal is probably okay. I want the best possible answer. But one one other benefit of doing this approach is maybe uh, it actually will be faster. Yeah, uh, because because exactly. you have smaller models, right? Yeah, faster and cheaper, right? Like yeah. if you have one model that's like super duper amazing and can answer everything, but costs thirty times as nice, you know, as another model that costs that costs one tenth as much that can answer 90% of the questions. You can save money, you can save cost. There's also a little overhead, to be honest, with the, the smart routing. Because if you're doing that using an LLM, so in our experiments, for example, having the smart routing adds about half a second. Um, but we think we can optimize that down to 0.1 or 0.2 seconds. So it delays the first token by something like half a second at the moment. Um, but but then uh, but then uh, the model is faster. You end up with a smaller model that's tuned and faster, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, but it's still you know there's still a little bit of overhead in the selection than just going straight to one model all the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. But all right, so let's close with a couple of uh, uh, industry wide trends that uh, I don't know if you agree with, but I'll throw it out there. Feel free, feel free to disagree. First yeah. trend. I think uh, we're months away from seeing AMD being a viable option for inference. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not just AMD. The MI300X is pretty darn impressive. And the cool thing that AMD has done is they've built a system called Rock M. Yep. It's very similar to CUDA. So that means 
porting all of the existing goodness is not a huge headache. But it's really part of a broader trend towards a more varied and heterogeneous um, accelerator architecture. At least for inference, right? Yeah, well, um, and, and for training too. I mean, most of yeah. the, the hardware that's coming out, and maybe the most interesting is, is AWS, who have separate, they have separate, there's a Trainium GPU, which is for a Trainium accelerator for training, and there's the Inferentia 2 accelerator for serving, right? So they've even gone one step further and had different accelerator architectures for each of them. But, you know, we're seeing a whole lot of trends with Intel coming out, um, yeah, I'm, I, I'd be happy to just have more options for inference, honestly. Yeah, I mean that's that's where I mean that's where most of the effort is because yeah. you know most of us are not training models from scratch, yeah. right? Exactly. Most of us are, and fine tuning at the end of the day is like it takes forty minutes and it's like a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars. Inference is the part that you know as practitioners we are most concerned about. But the other cool thing is all of those different accelerators all run on Ray, number one. And number two, there's an increasing growth towards what you might call MLIRs, Machine Learning Intermediate Representations. And that means you can take the same code and run it on any of those accelerators. Uh, in, in particular, there's a new standard supported by Google called XLA, uh, and they've just open sourced one of the libraries for processing XLA called OpenXLA. So, you know, all of this bodes well for a future of like multiple accelerators and more competition, because you know, as much as I love Nvidia, I never really like being beholden to one company. One for any... company, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. By yeah. the way, I, I, I'm advising another company in this space, IV, which uh, which is uh, trying to do it uh, across hardware and across software stacks. Mm -hmm. um, second, second trend, not trend, but I, I think this is my own paranoid concern, Walid, which mm -hmm. is. Uh, uh, I love these open source uh, base models, but uh, we only seem to have only two or three suppliers. <laughs> and, yeah. and the suppliers can change the license on us, right? Yeah. So there's no guarantee that the license for Llama 3 or Mistral 2 will be the same. So, uh, you know, so how do we get to the point where we have less dependence on a few outfits changing their mind? Yeah, well, I think we're, we're, there's actually quite a lot of diversity now. Um, and for example, there's the Falcon models coming out of UAE. No one, no one uses Falcon, Walid. I know, I know. <laughs> but you know, I mean, one eighty B is still one of. The, I mean, it's just because it's very hard to run one eighty B. Yeah. But we just keep seeing this constant development, and not just of the models, but of the data sets to train them, and and the toolkits to actually train these large models. I'm actually not that concerned about it happening organically. What I'm a little bit concerned about is over-regulation, actually. Yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 I'm worried that, uh, I'm worried that, because uh, right now, honestly, so the supply of the good models mm -hmm. is uh, Meta and Mistral. Yeah. So what happens if Meta says Llama tree? Okay, so we change the license. Yeah, well, I, I don't think that that's likely. Because yeah, yeah, that's true. But but uh, but still, you're in a position where someone else will come and fill the void. I have no con yeah. like I have no doubts of that, right? Yeah. Like every time we think that this is it. So remember, who so who who yeah. would who would be that outfit, Walid, in your mind? If who who would come in, like uh, Nvidia? It might be a governmental organization. So, for example, one of the early models, Bloom, was actually funded by the French government. Um, it might be collectives that, um, so you, I mean, we're starting to see an industry that kind of exceeds the size of just the LLM, right? So imagine if any scale could be part of a collective and that collective, it's almost at the stage where we have critical mass to kind of talk about a collective coming together and building a model. Um, but as I was saying, the bigger risk is over-regulation by, by the government who's listening to some of the closed API providers who are trying to create barriers to entry for and create moats around their businesses. I think if we can avoid that, the question of who builds the LLMs is the need is so great that some something will come in to fill the void. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, so, so is, I think Meta, hard, Meta is uh, Meta is motivated. That's good. Yeah. And but there's also I, people there like Jan LeCun who are very strong advocates. Of yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, Mistral, you know, I mean, they're a startup with no business model, so. 
I don't yeah. think they I don't think we should count on them as a supplier over the long term, right? So yeah, but I mean, I think you've scratched the surface. I mean, there was also companies like Mosaic that got purchased by Databricks that yeah. you know made available the, their Mosaic suite of models that was pretty good in some ways. Um, so you know, it's not impossible to train your own model. It just costs a lot of GPUs. Um, so you know, I'm, I'm less worried about that, assuming that we avoid the overregulation question. So when are you guys going to start having endpoints for non LLM foundation models? Mm. There's no, there's no need. I guess there's no demand, huh? Yeah. So that's a very no. I wouldn't say that. But you know, when you, you start to talk about multimodal things, um, the concern is, you know, and this is a contra. I, this is not a representative opinion yeah. of any scale. I'm just expressing a personal opinion. Every company uses words. Absolutely yeah. every company in the world uses words. Some use images. So yeah. I, I mean, I'm still yet to see like anything beyond a toy application that uses multimodal images in a significant way that really demonstrates the power. So, you know, I talk to people like this and says, well, what if you could do OCR in a document and then apply the LLM? And it's like, you can do that already. That's, there's, there's nothing new there under the sun. So I'm yet to see like compelling business application that really benefits from multimodal, um, aside from businesses that specifically focus on images, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So, uh, Adobe or Canva or OpenAI or one of these, or Midjourney or Stability or Runway, right? Like any of those companies, obviously you're gonna use LMMs because that's your business. But I can't see a world where, you know, kind of LMMs are used for customer service. I mean, I can imagine this application of if you take an image of your engine and the person. What, what about an uh, endpoint for uh, audio, whisper or audio? Oh, that's an, that's an interesting one. Um, Still language, but different modality, yeah. right? So. I mean, I, I think that one is a more interesting one. Um, the other great thing is the whisper model is still open source, believe it or not. Yeah. So, um, you know, even though it's built by OpenAI. Um, so that could be one. Of course, every organization uses language, but um, compared to LLMs, actually, speech recognition is considerably cheaper. <laughs> yeah, ironically. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, they run on phones, right? So yeah, offline. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And with and with that, thank you, Ali. This this has been great. I'll definitely bring you back in six months to get the temperature of uh, the space and. Uh, and figure out where we're at, if, whether you're right that we still have supplies of uh, open source models. I hope so. Yeah. I but, see. but uh, and again, reminder to our listeners, make sure you check the episode notes. I will put a lot of links to Walid's post and, and talks. Thank you so much, Ben. I've had a blast chatting with you today. And I really look forward to doing this with you again.